Welcome everyone. Just gonna give a few minutes to let people join us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ferdosa Hassan. I'm the Muslim Student Program Associate and Assistant Director of Interfaith Institute. Just want to welcome you guys to our today webinar. Today is a conversation about opium crisis in the Somali community. This event was not possible by was it was not <laughs> this event was possible by the Podolden Grant Ethics and also the Interfaith at Augsburg as well, the Muslim Student Association. Today is a, it's an important topic for me. I'm really, it's, this is a topic that's really hard. It's close to my heart. This is a conversation that has been going on for quite some time in the Somali community. Um, myself and several students have had these conversations back in 2019, um, where there are several students who were using and who also had family members who were lost or friends who were lost through this. So for that, before I begin, I would like to introduce um, my um, one of my students, Sharmarke. Sharmarke is the vice president of MSA, and he'll be the moderator for us, and he'll be introducing everyone else. Welcome. Well, thank you for those for those kind words. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sharmarke. I am currently a junior here at Augsburg University, uh, and I'll be today's moderator. Uh, uh, the first uh, panelist that we have here today with us is Farhe uh, uh is Minnesota's first ever uh, Somali female licensed alcohol and drug, drug counselor, and also a certified peer recovery specialist who is widely recognized as a leader with uh, regard to SUD and recovery advocacy and service delivery. Farhe, who is a person with lived, uh, with lived experience of SUD and recovery, is a fierce voice for the unmet uh, recovery needs of East Africans, especially women and young adults. Uh, Farhe is currently the founder of NIA Recovery Initiative, which is the first recovery organization in the nation to help uh, East African Muslim communities uh, here in Minnesota to sustain recovery after uh, treatment. Uh, Farhe is passionate about recovery and bridging the gap to uh, long-term uh, recovery She's currently the East African Community uh, Engagement Specialist uh, here with the city of Minneapolis. Uh, uh, folks, without further ado, please help me welcome uh, Farhe. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Sharmarke, for that warm um, introduction. Um, I will be... Um, I am, a, my, as Shamarka said, I'm a woman in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is I can um, show up for my family, my community, and um, my family and my friends as my authentic self. Um, recovery from substance use disorders um, has truly given me back my values and my traditions. Um, as a Muslim woman, um, I'm able to really help break barriers in my community by sharing my own recovery story. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you today to um, understand this concept of the opioid epidemic that is really affecting our community and the East African and Somalis. As you all know, you probably have known someone in the last few years that have overdosed on opioids. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the recovery aspect of it um, through Malade Islami and the path of peace. Um, Malade Islami is... Um, a 12-step support group, just like Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, Women for Sobriety. Um, it's to really help. We took the AA and NA concept of the 12 steps and we incorporated it into our own Muslim um, principles. Um, so I will, um, I can touch base on what that looks like. I am able to um, really help people today um, 
because we all know the aspect of a higher power in 12-step support group. Um, that is the fundamental aspect, like the heart and the core is believing in a power greater than yourself. Um, but before I get into all of that, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what is the root cause and, and the factors that contribute to the opioid epidemic in our communities first. Um, because we know that prevention is here, treatment is here, and then recovery is, is, is there's three different um, aspects of that. Um, so for me, growing up um, in Minneapolis, in, in Minnesota, as a young girl, I came to America when I was about um, first grade. Um, I wanted to fit in and be like other people and be like my classmates. And I didn't really understand, um, you know, kids are always so mean and, and being called the African booty scratcher, and being called these names and that bullying and those things really took a toll on me. Um, and I didn't have anybody else that really looked like me that were also in the schools. Um, this was early, like 1995, 1996, when Minnesota didn't have a lot of, they didn't have this diverse East African community that we have today. So being put in a school in St. Paul, it was me and my little sister were the only Somalis in the whole school. We went to school with a lot of Hmong children and, and white and African-American children. And we just looked like the odd ones out with our hamar and our hijabs. Um, so early on, I, I decided to fit in and, and I did that by taking my hijab off on the school bus and, and then putting my hijab back on when it was time for us to come back home. Um, but fast forward a little bit, that, sh that right there was telling me that I was not okay with who I was inside and I wanted to change. And that's not okay for a young girl um, to really hide who she is, that, that true identity and that true um, sense of self, not to be okay with who I was. I didn't have a lot of role models growing up either. We went to Duxi or Quran um, Islamic school on Saturdays and Sundays. So we always picked up from where we left off on a Friday or a Saturday morning when the van was gonna come and pick us, um, pull up and pick us up and take us to Duxi. Um, so fast forward a little bit more, I didn't really start drinking until I was in college. Um, and, and that was through peer pressure as well as we know the, um, it's really like the root cause of, of all the issues that I stem from my early childhood um, to when I was when I went to college to really experiment with other um, people that also look like me and, and we went out to the parties and we went to clubs and things like that and we didn't know how to balance that life because in the beginning as a Muslim I was never meant for this world this this outside of this realm of of the evilness that comes with being in clubs and things like that. Um, I know as a Muslim that um, I have angels that are protecting me at all times. And if I'm not able to really um, have that relationship with Allah, um, God, um, that angels are going to leave me and they're not going to go with me to a club where I am not supposed to be there. So I invited a lot of evilness and, and a lot of that early on into my life. So um, the path from God's path was further away. I was so further away from God's path because now I was able to mix alcohol and drugs into the mix. And therefore that relationship that I had with God was broken. Um, but I, I hid everything from my family because there's a lot of stigma and shame that comes with being a woman, being a Muslim woman, um, and being a mom, because I was also a mom too. And that stigma and that shame really kept me in, in, in a really low, low, low point in my life where um, I didn't have anybody to talk to. At the same time, I was being judged by what the community and the society and everybody thought about me. And I remember when I first, um, uh, you know, and there's a lot of other external factors too, where my mom was also made, able to make a lot of supplications to me because everybody in my family just thought that I was I was lost, that I was a lost cause, that I wasn't contributing either. I wasn't contributing either to my life here in this dunya, this world, and also in the hereafter. 
Akhira. So um, I was really uh, in a really bad place. Um, Alhamdulillah, all praise to God that I was able to really uh, have another chance at my life today because of recovery. And, and early in my recovery, um, I didn't know who to turn to as there was no programs for East Africans or no programs for Muslims. Um, I didn't know who I could connect with. I went to the mosques to ask them for help and the imams and they all turned me away um, because they didn't understand this either. And I finally found a place through AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, in a church basement of all places. Uh, and, and I found my hope and healing and peace in a basement of our church. Like imagine that as a Muslim female trying to recover from alcohol and drugs and 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 I found it in 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 this concept of um Christianity based church in the basement where people like me that were alcoholics went down there to talk about their experience, their strength, and their hope. And I was like, yay, this is amazing. And, 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 and you know, a few years um, in, I was able to really work in treatment programs and, and help other people find recovery. And, um, and then I came across Malade Islami. And, and, and I want to talk a little bit about Malade Islami. Um, so if you can please go down to the next um if you can go to the next uh, slide, I would appreciate that. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, Allah says in the Quran in Surah 5, ayats 9 and 30, verses 90 and 91, O oh, you who believe intoxicants, gambling, dedication to stones, and divination by arrows are evil of shaitan's handiwork. Avoid such evils that you may prosper. Shaitan's plan, Shaitan is Satan's plan, is but to excite hostility and hatred between you with intoxicants and gambling and hinder you from the remembrance of Allah and from prayer, will you not then abstain? And this here tells me that I was mixing in, like I was mixing in in a world where I did not belong in the beginning. Um, that Shaitan is, is actually, it's the devil and, and, and the devil's plan is to always divert me from that path of peace, that path to God. So therefore, um, um, Allah is reminding us here that God is here reminding us that we're not, you know, that this is evil that alcohol and, and gambling and, and early on, um, you know, they did, um, the dedication to stones is people that, um, you know, they threw stones and like you cut the kind of pick. I'm sure I'm, I'm just, I can explain a little bit more of that if you all need to. But can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So um, this is the concept of um, who is really addicted. And most people, if you are having an issue with alcohol and drugs, you already know that you are. There is really no better person than yourself to really identify the issues that are really impacting you in, 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 your, um, in the way that alcohol and drugs have really manipulated your life in this progressive illness and that it is a brain disease. Um, so what happens to us is we are people that live in the grips of a continuing and a progressive illness whose ends are always the same. We have decreased in our faith, which is our Iman, which leads us to jails, institutions, or death. Um, obviously, a lot of people have overdosed. Um, a lot of people have died because of this disease. Um, it, it gets people into jail and it definitely keeps people in institutions in mental health, N um, mental health institutions. Next slide, please. So Malada Islami is a fellowship of men and women who have joined together on our path to peace. And we share our, experience, ex our experiences, strength, and our hope while recovering from our active addiction to mind and mood altering substances. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. So why? Why are we here and why do we do the work that we do? Um, whoever recommends and helps a good cause becomes um, a partner therein, and whoever helps uh, or recommends um, an evil cause shares his burden and Allah's wrath power over all things. So that's from Surah 5, Ayat 85. Um, 
it's pretty much letting us know that if, if you want to do something good, you're also going to get the reward of that good work. And if you do the, and if you're not doing, and you're engaging in the evil aspects of things, you're also going to get that evil um, deed as well. So next slide, please. So how it works. So this is really what I wanted to talk about. And this is really what I want to cover because I love this part of recovery. Next slide, please. So um, when we are able to really come into recovery, we want to come with an open heart. We want to come with a great love because everything we do is by intention and with Nia. Nia means intention. Hopefully, um, when people are into this part of their recovery aspect, they come and the first step is we admitted that we are neglectful of our higher selves and that our lives have become unmanageable. Higher self means that connection to God, because ultimately, um, as a Muslim, I believe that I was only um, Allah created me so that I can worship him. And, 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 and that is the ayah in the Quran that says, why are we here um, so that we can worship God, um, that jinn and, man, and human may worship God. Um, two is came to believe that Allah could and would restore us to sanity. Because when we're using alcohol and drugs, we are further away from God's path and that we are just a sense of insanity. We're not at peace with ourselves. We're always just, you know, and insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, trying to expect different, different results. And that's that insanity. So we come to believe in Allah and that Allah could restore us to sanity. And, and I'm a living proof of that uh, because I have also turned my, um, in, ma in making a decision to submit our will to the will of Allah. And that is step three. Um, because when we're out there in our active addiction, we are a self-run will riot. And we just want to really, um, and it's the enough. That's the enough part of us that just wants to, um, you know, that instant gratification. So if we're able to just surrender and submit our will to the will of Allah, we're going to have some peace in our heart, in our, um, yeah, in our heart. Um, four is we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Um, this is just really about having, um, Having the, I'm sorry guys, um, it's my Adan. <laughs> um, uh, sorry about that, I apologize. Um, but no, I shouldn't apologize. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, when we're, so the fearless moral inventory is really searching deep down inside getting a list of all the things because we know that fear is what really keeps us going and fear keeps us away from all the things that we want to do. Fear is false evidence appearing real. So we want to be able to connect that back to Allah and also help uh, Allah help us to really identify what we're you know, what we're, what our fear is, what have we done? And like, this is how you, this is like the meat and the potatoes of like doing your step work is step four. We want to do a really fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Helps us to also identify what our strengths are, what our barriers are, what our challenges and all of those things. Um, number six, um, no, number five is we admitted to Allah and to ourselves the exact nature of our wrongs. I understand that a lot of people um, oftentimes say, uh, well, it's your sins. You know, you've committed all the sins. What? And they say this to me too, like um, your sins should be only between you and God. Why are you out here, po you know, posting things about um, recovery or like, you know, you were addicted to this and that. Um, I get it. Um, but also I want to be able to help other people. And it's through my Nia that I, at night, Yes, I do admit to Allah the exact nature of our, because Allah already knows I've messed up. I, Allah already understands, I know everything that has happened to me, it was decreed for me, but I also want to be, do better to help other people. Thank you. I got five minutes. Uh, number six is asking Allah for right guidance. 
we become willing and open for change, ready to have Allah remove our defects of character. Um, number seven is we humbly ask Allah to remove our shortcomings. Based on number four, the moral inventory, you're going to understand um, some of the shortcomings that you have based on that step. And then you ask Allah to help remove that. Um, eight is we made a list of persons we have harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. This is part of the forgiveness process. Um, and you wanna ask, you know, you wanna make a list of everybody that you have harmed. And then one by one, start calling those people because you know on the day of judgment that any, anything that you did to other people, they have the choice to not forgive you, but Allah always forgives you. So you wanna be able to really help yourself by asking other people to help um, to forgive you too. Um, number nine is you made direct amends to those people whenever possible. Um, number 10 is you always continue, continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. It's so important to always, always understand that concept of like making sure that, you know, we're not perfect. Everybody makes mistakes and that we want to be able to do the right thing. We start up, um, through Salat and Iqra to improve our understanding of Taqwa and Ihsan. Um, we pray five times a day and we continue to do that. Um, you know, if you want to pray your extra prayers, that's a kudos to you. But understanding that the prayer is an important aspect of your recovery. Iqra is understanding the studying um, of the Quran, the surah, the, the deen, um, and then also taqwa, um, that knowledge. And then ihsan, um, you know, worshiping God um, as you may see him, uh, like you may, like you can see him even though you cannot see God. Um, number 12, um, having increased our level of Iman, Taqwa, um, as a result of working these steps, we carried this message to humanity and became practicing these principles in all our affairs. Um, inshallah, when we're able to really do these steps, we're able to really understand and have that um, increased faith, which means you increased Iman. Um, because of this, um, I've worked these steps. Um, I can say that my level of Iman has increased, alhamdulillah, um, that I have a great relationship with my, um, my creator. Um, and I'm able to also help other people through what the challenges that I have faced and turn all of those obstacles into strengths. Um, and inshallah, um, you know, you should be able to succeed. Honesty is important. There's other, um, because of the timing, I can't really get into it, but there's a lot of other spiritual principles behind each of these steps. Um, I am open to taking questions later at the end. Um, but yeah, so th this is this is what recovery looks like in, in our Muslim community. And, um, and, you know, it's gonna just take more than one person. So I have a team of people that also um, do um, do this work with me um, in the community level, sharing their recovery story and just doing a lot of interventions. Uh, we wanna say that we're not immune to this disease and that we're just like everybody else, just because we wear a hijab, doesn't mean um, that we're immune. Um, it's just that a lot of our community members hide things under the rug. And that's why we have a lot of overdoses and we're not very open about it, but hopefully things can change moving forward. Um, thank you so much. Salaam alaikum. Thank you so much for here. <clears throat> uh, thank you for sharing us with your experience. And I hope we have all, uh, found that informative and, and can go back into our lives and, and, and understand our community a bit more, a little better. Uh, our next panelist uh, on today's list will be uh, a former student of Augsburg. Uh, his name is Adnan Deh, also known as CK. Uh, he is a former student of Augsburg University, like I mentioned before. Adnan studied uh, MIS and a, minor, and a minor in marketing. He currently works uh, as a consultant for the uh, CACFP here in, uh, program here in Minnesota. Uh, and then uh, if you could just give your on, on the matter, we appreciate it. Thank you. You're on mute. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon to everybody in here. Um, I want to thank Fardosa for inviting me over to this panel. Um, 
Farhia did a good job of starting this off, um, mashallah. But um, I'm gonna get right into it. Um, so I'm 22 years old, um, former student at Augsburg. I grew up in the South Minneapolis community. Um, came to America when I was two years old and been living in Minnesota ever since. Um, I've been in the South side of the neighborhood ever since I, by like the age of five. So I've been there a long time and um, I've actually lost a lot of family and um, friends to uh, opioids. Um, luckily, um, I didn't go down that path um, due to a lot of things. And I consider those things blessings in my life. Um, today, I'm here to speak a little bit about my experiences of just, you know, seeing the opioid crisis affect my community, especially coming from the South side uh, neighborhood where it's deeply rooted in our, basically in our system now because everybody is either taking part in this or they have someone that's a family member that's going through this stuff. Um, growing up, one thing that I've always uh, said is um, with, with opportunities um, comes blessings. And the reason why I say that is because I feel like sometimes when people do go down this route, people don't understand that maybe they're using this as a coping mechanism or, or sometimes these people are just like, like for he was talking about the peer pressure, you know, where sometimes you don't feel like yourself and you do things out of the ordinary. Um, a couple of years back when I was back at Augsburg, um, me and Fardosa would always talk about this topic a lot, you know, and I kind of felt like I had a responsibility to take part in this stuff because I was one of those guys that, you know, I've always had opportunities, you know, um, all throughout high school, I played uh, high school sports and stuff. And I feel like that kind of helped me keep me on the right path because of my coaches and stuff and how they always made me go to after school workouts and stuff like that. And I was always playing sports. So when you're playing sports, you can't, it's hard to do drugs and play sports, you know, because if you're doing drugs, then you're not fit. And if you're not fit, then your coaches aren't happy, you know, and I feel like that helped me a lot. And then when I got over to college, um, I kind of realized um, after my football career came to an end, um, then, you know, that's when people start, you know, going out and stuff like that. And, and I wasn't working out as much. So I even experienced how it feels not to be fit anymore. And, and one thing that I've realized is that, um, that in our community, the, the stigma around this, like people didn't understand it back then, but now the conversations like this are starting to happen more and more, which is really good. But I feel like the most important thing that people are forgetting about is that um, the youth are the ones that go through this. Um, when Frihia was explaining her story, it was during her youth that she went through this and now she's an adult. But I feel like if we, if we come up with different initiatives and different programs that are targeted towards youth and setting up different opportunity systems for the youth, um, that's a really good way to start fighting this disease. Um, another thing that I believe in is that if we come together as a community and fight this together as a community in a whole, it's, it's also a good way to fight the disease. Um, one thing that I've realized is when it comes to youth initiatives and youth programs, there's a lot of people in our community who stand up for us and say, we do this and this for the youth, or we're gonna open up the center for the youth, or we're gonna, we're gonna get, take this money or specific funding and we're gonna give it to the youth to create more opportunities and stuff. And I can say for myself that maybe about 20% of those people are the ones that come to her at the end of the day. Um, there's people like Fardosa. Um, when I met with Fardosa, the reason why I even got a little bit closer to her was I seen the drive of her to help her community, you know, her coming from the South neighborhood as well. Um, we made that connection because I was from one side of the Somali community, she's from the other side. And me and her understood, it was like, okay, we got all these people around us saying they wanna do this and they haven't been doing it. So people like us have a responsibility to take that role. And part of the reason why I'm here today is to be a part of the conversation and just explain a little bit um, in detail of, like how it feels to grow up in the community. So um, I'm gonna tell you, tell you guys one story. Um, I had a buddy, right, of mine. So, um, he was actually my cousin, but um, he was a good person, you know? And one thing that I realized time and time as more and more people have died to this kind of stuff is that anybody could be in that position today, um, including myself today, you know? I consider myself a very smart, elegant individual. And and I believe that I could, I could one day be in that, walk through that door and then that door closes on you. 
And one of my friends, my cousin, the way he actually explained it to me was, um, he said, addiction is like you walking into a dark room, you open the door, you know what you're doing, but then you might go too deep in where you turn around, the door is gone. And now you're just in the, like a dark room. And, and when he explained that to me, it didn't make sense to me at first, but then it hit me like, it's like, okay, the way he explained it was, it starts off with one thing, it goes on to the next, and it goes on to the next. Then you get to the point where you have your whole the withdrawals and all that stuff, and you can't, you, you can't, you can't beat this disease by yourself now. Like you need, you need help, you know, and you need people around you to support you and stuff like that. So that's why me, I'm, when it comes to this stuff, I think it's a very sensitive topic. Um, I don't try to give people advice of how to deal with this stuff because I'm, I feel like I'm not that much knowledgeable about it on the on the, like the medical side and like like how does it affect your brain and what do these drugs do to your body i'm not like i'm not knowledgeable about that but one thing i could speak on is that if we don't give our youth opportunities our youth are going to keep dying um if the, if the funding and is not given to the right people then our youth are going to keep dying if um people are just going to keep you know doing these projects for let's say to get more resources let's say and funding or to get recognition and then our youth are going to keep dying. And I feel like this initiative, our community has to figure out a way where this initiative could be more youth driven too as well, because these are the people that are being affected the most. I'll end it there. Uh, thank you so much, Adnan. Uh, some time providing a perspective from uh, a younger, uh, a young man's standpoint. Uh, We'll, our, our next feature, uh, our, our next panelist for today's list is going to be uh, an educator, a community leader. Uh, Sheikh Abdul Salam Adam uh, has been an active member of the Minnesota Muslim community for over 25 years. He's involved in religious, educational, and social institutions. He's on the board of Islamic Civic Society of America and the Speakers Bureau of Islamic Resource Group. Sheikh Abdul Salam has been with the with uh, St. Paul Public Schools since 1997 as an ESL teacher, community specialist, and an administrator. He's currently a, uh, an assistant principal at Highland Park Senior High School. He also serves on the board of Fridley Public Schools. Uh, Shah Abdul Salam strives to build bridges of understanding among Americans of all backgrounds. Uh, let's turn the floor to Shah Abdul Salam, also known as Mahan Abdul Salam. Thank you very much, Almarke, and uh, I'm grateful to be part of this panel and greetings to all the participants of this uh, program. I think the foundation has been laid beautifully by Farhia and Adnan through their lived experiences and the example that they have shown from their real life. So I think I'll just try to uh, put perspectives from the Islamic faith what does the religion say about some of these issues? I mean, Farhia has really pointed out that those 12 steps, each has foundation within the faith. So um, how does Islam address these issues and what's the proper understanding of the religion uh, relating to opioids uh, and drugs and alcohol and things like that? So as a starting point, I just want to get it out of the way that all human beings are honored in the understanding of Islam, that when God created human beings, he created them with a role of worshiping him and also representing God on earth by being stewards of the earth and of the universe and serving others. So no one is to be marginalized, no one is to be segregated. So that's the general understanding. Also life, and uh, our destiny is controlled by God, who is the, the creator of the universe. So as human beings, we have relative choice and freedom. We're not absolutely free, but we also have choices. And we may choose to take a path that's contrary to what God wants and what the faith teaches, that of course, Abrahamic religions. And the different religions, they do teach certain paths that the followers should take. Or somebody may choose different way and break the rules and and then out of that will be consequences. How, however, in light of all this, um, God is merciful and his mercy supersedes his punishment. And in the Islamic faith, there's a balance of worldly life and the hereafter. The second point I would like to draw atten our attention to is the health issues and 
of course, the human being consists of physical needs, spiritual, mental, social, and emotional. And the spiritual needs is very important in Islamic faith, which we sometimes see our secular systems kind of not paying as much attention. And I would like to uh, really point that there should be real partnership between the hospitals and the healthcare system and the faith institutions so that the person is dealt with or is, is healed and treated with all the different needs. And in the Islamic faith, there are five essential things that are to be protected, that should be preserved. So religion, life, the mind or the intellect, property or wealth, and the family are all unique and sacred. So um, the religion puts steps to, to, to support all those. And as part of that, Islam forbids harmful things to the body or to the, to the mind or to the intellect or to the uh, religion. And so this is where the uh, prohibition of alcohol, drugs, uh, opioids, smoking, vaping, all of this will be seen as harming the, the body of the human being. And therefore, since they're harmful, then they are forbidden or haram in the Islamic religious teachings. That's not to say that human beings or even Muslims would not break the rules, they, they will. All human beings are fallible, everybody makes, makes mistakes, but Islam calls on one to come back. So for her story of how she started, the struggles that she went through, how uh, sadly, you know, Muslim institutions did not have the space for her, but she found that in a church basement. Again, is that yearning for peace. And so that coming back is highly praised in the Islamic faith. And also within the Islamic tradition, um, you know, harming oneself is forbidden. So God owns the body. Even we don't own our body. So suicide is forbidden. The Quran says, do not kill yourselves. Surely Allah or God is merciful to you. Third, I would like to uh, point out accountability system in Islam. So what happens if somebody breaks the rules and what has the accountability system? So there are angels with every person that write everything that the person does, whether good or bad. So that's where you know, everything is held in place. And also um, when the Islamic approach, um, you know, uh, that accountability system, there are rewards. So when the person does something good, then they get 10 rewards for it. They multiplied by 10. Every good deed is multiplied by 10 or even more and many folds, sometimes unlimited, unlimited. But when one makes a mistake, it's counted as one. So that shows you that the balance is on the side of reaping the rewards. If every reward counts as 10 times what only God knows, and then the mistake counts as one, then one has the chance for that, you know, good deeds to, uh, you know, supersede the bad deeds. So that's the accountability system that shows us the mercy, the forgiveness, the coming back has a huge place in the Islamic faith. So one should never despair. One should never lose hope. One should never um, say that I've gone too far or because I'm committing sins, then I'll keep going. And that's uh, in, the, in the Islamic tradition is uh, frowned upon. So um, how does the person come back? So the approach is, is to repent. That's to admit you know, one's uh, mistakes and ask God directly. So Islam calls for one to pray to God directly in the you know, good times, in the middle of the night, prayer times, and raise their hands and ask for forgiveness with, with sincere intention. The word niya that for his organization is called means intention. So every action is, is judged by the intentions. So stop what you are doing or whatever situation that you're in that's bad that you feel guilty about withdraw from it, desist from it, and then also clear with people that you have harmed, kind of repair the harm that you have done to others, and God will forgive you as a result. Some of the steps that uh, Islam encourages people to take in their struggle is to have good company. So friends and the people that you are with do have a huge influence on the person. And through that also, you know, role models, people that to emulate, people who will show you, you know, uh, whether it's academic or whether it's social or whether it's economic. Um, so having good role models is also emphasized in the faith as well as mentorship. Um, people that can show you like either elders or, you know, 
uh, students who are older than you or people who have gone through the experience or professionals, that's also encouraged as a way to get out of the bad habits or the neighborhoods or situations that are uh, not safe for the uh, youth. Also changing the location, like either leave the place, if possible, travel. Um, some people travel to, let's say, East Africa or to Mecca or, or even uh, just being out of that situation. Because sometimes within the core group that the person is with, it may be just vicious cycle. So getting out of that is also encouraged and to, to, to discover new energy and different way of dealing with things. And also, Islam highly emphasizes seeking refuge against ailments, that sickness, or against uh, Satan's temptations, or um, anything that one is afraid of. So um, there are verses of the Quran that people memorize, there are hadith or the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that uh, one is encouraged to say, for example, in one of the hadith, a Muslim is, is uh, asked to say that um, I seek refuge in the good names of Allah or good words of Allah from all the hard, harmful things that he created. So just seeking that refuge and you know, uh, 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 protection from God is also encouraged. And that's what Farhia did in her journey as she told us. And also being uh, grateful, you know, showing gratitude for what we have, um, not always looking at what we don't have. So again, being content, um, being humble. These are also some attributes that Islam encourages uh, people so that they don't uh, look at, you know, getting rich quickly or, you know, earning money through, you know, uh, uh, um, means that are unlawful. You know, all of these are ways for the person to come back to God. And finally, I would like to address the role of the mosques. Um, yes, um, unfortunately, the, the mosques are, I mean, the Muslim community is relatively new um, in Minnesota, especially majority immigrants. I mean, they have been African-American Muslims and some uh, white American Muslims before uh, the immigrants came in large numbers. But uh, I think the huge movement that we noticed when the East African uh, community came here, so, um, it's a relatively new community, so uh, there's lack of capacity when it comes to staffing or funding, and sometimes the separation of church and state that you know the CS U.S. system operates with uh, 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 gets an obstacle for you know Muslim institutions to find a way to uh, get funding. Some of them are now becoming more resourceful, trying to hire uh, grant writers, uh, trying to establish social um, wings so that the the, the social services will be separate from the worshiping or the, um, the mosque activities. So we are learning uh, in the process, but yes, uh, we do not have uh, mosques that have the services to address opioid needs or you know, mental health in full capacity. But I mean, within the limited um, resources that they have, I do see a lot of people who are coming to the mosques, um, getting prayers, getting uh, reminders you know, to be connected to God, to put their trust in God, um, getting positive messages that the, temp the test that you are going through, better days will come. And, uh, and, and so not to, not to uh, give in, not to despair, uh, and building the resilience and coping mechanism. That's something that we have seen all the mosques. So usually when a person is sick, uh, the first place they go to is the mosque. They will come. Then uh, now the mosques are encouraging uh, collaboration between the health institutions and the, the, the friend institution to work together. And our mosque, uh, my mosque is called Dar al in Cedar Riverside. We're now working with a lot of uh, hospitals to kind of address that, you know, accepting uh, Muslim chaplains, uh, let them attend to the sick and, you know, uh, deal with them, the, the opioids or the youth are struggling. And so kind of building the capacity of the mosque is something that we are aware of. Um, we do feel the pain of the youth. We are at a loss that we're losing uh, many young uh, uh, people, both um, boys and girls, uh, to opioids and uh, to other vice uh, that are unfortunately uh, prevalent in some of the neighborhoods and some of the communities. So um, we do understand that. We do feel the pain. And we are striving to uh, learn from these experiences. And uh, better days will come for our community and we appreciate Oxford University for arranging this uh, panel. Thank you so much, everyone.
Well, thank you so much, uh, Shahad Islam, uh, for your insightful perspective on, uh, on, uh, on this given topic from a faith standpoint. We appreciate you guys' time for coming and taking some time away from your personal lives and, and providing your experiences and your knowledge. And we as MSA hope to uh, get the knowledge attained here today and uh, reach back to our community uh, with whatever resources given. Uh, next on our agenda right now, uh, we're gonna shift our gears here on, uh, and uh, move on to our Q and A's. We know that our participants here have a lot of questions. Uh, so we'll be giving them some time where they could uh, write out questions and, and or concerns, whatever. That, that may be the case. Uh, I'll, I'd like to turn over to Cordosa. Well, she'll, she'll be the moderator for Q and A's. Thank you guys. Thank you, Sharmarke. I appreciate that. And thanks everyone for taking the time and to, to be with us and as well. Um, you know, this is really, like I said, this topic is so dear to me and I appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone sharing and being vulnerable here, because to be honest, it takes a courageous, um, courageous individuals to speak about this topic. And I appreciate it and your willingness to share with us. So now we're going to take questions from the audience. So anybody who has a question, you could put in the chat. Um, I'm taking those questions. Um, I can also, um, I like that. Bishop Mark Hansen, can, do you have a question? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, each one of you, for the vulnerability and the insights. Uh, you've all talked about the choices individuals make that lead to a path of uh, use and then ultimately abuse and addiction. I'm wondering to what extent Islamophobia and a culture of racial hostility and perpetuation of systems of white power and privilege how do those societal factors contribute to a culture that leads to choices that lead to addiction among East Africans? Or do you see no correlation between uh, those factors of Islamophobia and white power and privilege and racial hostility that were, it's just permeating our culture today? Do you see a correlation or not between the, that cultural context and rising addiction in the East African community. I, I'd be curious if each of you had an insight or at least one or two of you about that question. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Um, I think Shagab Salam, would you like to answer that? Yes, that's a huge question. This uh, itself uh, can take a whole panel, uh, but thank you, Bishop, for the question. Uh, I think, um, for the person's well-being, again, the spiritual component is important. So identity of who I am is very important. So if a person uh, find themselves as the other and have to address who they are all the time, or they or they are being questioned, or being addressed in a negative way, always associated with terrorism, or something wrong that's happening, while at the same time not finding the role models or the um, you know, uh, community members within them that they identify with that support them. It does send message, negative message to the person. And so that leads to uh, coping or uh, being in denial or being hiding from who you are. So I think uh, the question that you raise does lead to um, young people or even adults who get confused, you know, the mental health in the adults, um, they turn to drugs because mostly people take alcohol or drugs or other advice to uh, mitigate some pain or suffering that they're going through. So um, I do see direct relationship with uh, not being accepted and having to be the other and always being questioned as contributing to identity crisis. Um, thank you, um, Bishop, for that question. Um, I too would say that it definitely is a factor um, into substance use, even after a person um, has used. 
um, the way the police engages with individuals that are East African that have used or uh, when they do go to treatment and they have a substance use disorder diagn diagnosis, um, those can be some disparities, even in the way that care is administered, um, because they might have like a PMAP, which is prepaid medical assistance as insurance. Um, I remember for me, um, personally, this has happened to me where my white counterparts would be driven home because we were intoxicated. But guess who goes to jail? I went to jail because I was just a black Muslim Somali girl and I was intoxicated. So those things, I mean, in our society and even like the shift of everything that has happened lately, um, those are some, you know, contributing factors, I would say, that leads to even more substance use. So thanks. CK. I guess not. So thank you for that. I think for me, one of the things that I have to say, it is a factor. And a lot of times it's also like um, some of the um, institutionalized racism and some phobia and things like that. So a lot of individuals, a lot of young men are 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 dealing with all these battles and yet that they, they have to figure out way or young women way to avoid that pain, figure a way to suppress that pain. And I think that's where drugs come in. And then also lack of opportunities, disparities. So I think that's another key. It's like, if you look at where um, rise of like the opium or drugs or anywhere that you see is neighborhoods that are don't have resources. And I think that's where the main factors comes in too. It's, it's having those disparities and lack of resources. And I think that's what CK was trying to have that conversation with me back in 2018 is it's about how do we create resources for young people before they even get to where they need to get to it so I think that's where um, there are opportunities but those opportunities are not designed the way that that would suit for the young people in our neighborhood and I think that's where it comes in that there's this mindset of um, white you know white like white supremacy white like whitewashed way of things rather than trying to figure out way how does this community works for this and how do we support this community through that and rather than like going into like the yeah so so i don't see any other questions so i'm going to ask one more and uh, for here you cited going to church basements but as a christian uh, who's been a minister in those churches people coming to the church basement for recovery and community of support and 12 step don't often feel welcome upstairs where people are gathered to worship the so-called Christian community. They had to create their own community of recovery because they still felt excluded, shamed, stigmatized. Do you sense any of that dynamic within the relationship of the recovery community in uh, in the Muslim community and mosques and how can that be addressed and how can we as Christians learn from how you're addressing it um yeah I think it um, a lot of our community members want that holistic approach to like involving the imams and and the mosques and having um doing a group inside a mosque um the mosques, unfortunately, are really reluctant to let people that are actively using or people that are in recovery come into that space, especially in our communities. Um, and that is such an unfortunate thing. Um, people want the service, more people, um, like we have a space right now at the Brian Coyle Center uh, because I'm able to like have that relationship with that community-based um, organization. Uh, of course, I would love to have these um, conversations with our imams and see what we can do to work together. Um, so I, I don't know, I think it's more than just one conversation is really having a group of imams that are also edu have the education around substance use and recovery, and having them to be stakeholders in, in these individuals lives. So um, yeah, that's all I have right now. Um, I think it's more than just this, <laughs> but I can talk about a lot of other things that relate to the mosque. I wanna be able to help build capacity and infrastructure 
within our imams because I think there are just important leaders in our community. And when they don't see substance use disorder as a um, as an important topic, um, it, it's it's sad. But I'm glad uh, Abdusalam, Sheikh Abdul Salam is here today. Well, thank you. I hear you for hear loudly and, and clearly. And uh, Alyssa Dari is on the other side of Syria Riverside. So I think uh, the Imam of the mosque is called Sheikh Abdurrahman Sharif. And he has really been pioneering the work with uh, chaplaincy and you know working with the hospitals. And, and now he has started some one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, sessions, but it's more listening. So um, we still don't have the capacity, let's say where you cancel and kind of it leads to referral and that uh, we don't have that capacity yet. So maybe partnership with uh, people who are in the field and then the imams, then maybe something good will come out of it. So I would recommend connecting with uh, Imam Shah Abdurrahman. And since you're in the same neighborhood, I think we can work together and you know, inform the other uh, mosques and uh, imams as well. But I know there's a huge gap there definitely and we feel the pain. Uh, it looks like we have two more questions here from uh, our participants. Uh, first question from Sigland. Uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. He said, how can uh, lo local nonprofits better reach youth in the community? I think CK has a, um, CK, are you there? I think we have a lot yeah. of CK. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, you can answer that question. All right. So the question is, how can local nonprofits better reach youth in the community, marketing, and word of mouth? Um, I feel like one way that it could be done is um, if 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 we could figure out a way to make the connection between the youth-driven nonprofit organizations that work with uh, the opioid stuff and then making that connection between the older generation nonprofit organizations. And, and I think the best way to do it is, let's say the, the, um, the bigger nonprofit organizations are the ones that are getting the funding for the project. Maybe they can start including the younger nonprofit, organi like the, the younger leaders of the community that are, are um, leading their own nonprofit initiatives and for just figuring out a way to create a bridge because I feel like the biggest issue we have right now is we have a lot of nonprofits that are going in front of the state or going in front of certain people and saying that we're gonna be doing this work and the work's not being done. And the other issue is, is um, some of these organizations understand that they do need the youth on their side to pursue these initiatives. And, and I much respect to those, and it, to those guys because I feel like those guys understand that the, one of the best ways to solve this issue is with the youth and by the youth. So, yeah, I don't know if that's the right answer. Uh, I'll add um, that I think uh, the approach of, let's say, outside organizations coming in to the community, like this, uh, the savior that we know everything, we have the resources, we can do this. I think that model is not, is, is not working and it's not right. So I would uh, recommend uh, really approaching the, the let's say if there's an organization or certain youth to work with them, listen to them, let them you know, co-create the working together and the needs assessment and all of that. So that will be more productive. There's a, there's a sense of ownership and there's also a sense of community involvement that may lead to the parents, may lead to faith leaders kind of. So that'll be more uh, inherently homegrown kind of uh, approach. Sounds good. Uh, we have another question, and I believe this one is aimed towards Farhia. Uh, this person, Abdurrahman Noor, said, uh, for the NEED program, how are the families involved in the recovery program? In other words, are, like, are the families more receptive to the idea of like uh, joining? In yeah. Um, thank you, um, Abdurrahman, for that question. Um, the usually it's family that reach out to us first and not the individual. Um, it's always the Hoyos, the moms that really reach out to us and how families are really involved um, is 
we do what's called a family intervention uh, because we know that um, addiction is a family disease too. It only not affects the person that is, um, you know, that's dealing with it, but also it affects everybody that lives in that household. It includes the younger siblings too, because the mom is really taking time away from her younger kids to deal with this one individual that is struggling. Um, so we sit all the families together um, and it's usually in the evening time um, where the family where the family member is there and we have this conversation, this very honest conversation um, with the individual in a very non-judgmental way. A lot of our community members don't really know how to deal with someone who's affected by substance use disorders. So we also are um, able to help use language that is non-labeling language, um, using a lot of I statements, using motivational interviewing skills to help elicit some of that um, change talk within the individual, because I know the individual has it in them to recover. We just got to get them into the surface because that individual is deep down inside, but the darkness of that addiction is what really surrounds that individual and they cannot see clearly, they cannot think. So having that opportunity to sit down with their family and I mean, it, it goes really deep, everyone. Like when we're in there, it's it's very personal. There's a lot of crying, there's a lot of emotions. And and I, we've had a lot of successes where people did go to treatment and, and sustain their recovery. So um, great, great question. Thank you. Now we're gonna to turn to Bishop Mark Henson. He's gonna close us out because we are 502. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Fardosa and Shamarki and the Muslim Student Association for co-sponsoring this. And thank you, Abdislam and Farhia and CK for your excellent presentations. To all of you who have joined us, thank you. Uh, there will be a copy of this videotape posted later on the Campus Ministry YouTube channel. So you hopefully will use this in different settings as an education tool and an opportunity to begin uh, a dialogue in your context. This is several one of several webinars that Interfaith at Augsburg has done addressing the intersectionality of our religious convictions and practices and diversity and the challenges we face in our personal lives, in our communities, and in our nation. Just one quick announcement. Uh, I am delighted that to the generosity of Fuad and Nancy Al-Hibri, we have now established the al Hebri Endowed Chair and Executive Director of Interfaith at Augsburg. We've just begun a national search. So stay tuned for an announcement in coming months of a new director to, uh, for this center. Augsburg University believes very deeply that we can collectively create a society where religious diversity serves the common good. Today's webinar has been one example of that conviction. We are grateful for your participation and look forward to the next opportunity to be in conversation with you. Thank you all and good afternoon.